Well, good afternoon. I'm David Gray. Welcome to the New America Foundation for our discussion on the future of work and family. I have to admit I've been looking forward to this uh, event uh, all spring as we have some of what I think are some of the most interesting thinkers and writers on demographic, workforce, and gender trends in the country here today. Lisa Guernsey, another interesting thinker, uh, was to join us, but it was called away at the last minute. As we know, the relationships between men and women, families and work, parents and children are changing in all sorts of ways that should cause us to rethink our assumptions about what the future will look like. And indeed, many of the structures of our society have and will have to change to keep pace. And today, we're going to look at some of how those structures and assumptions have changed, are changing, and what the future will look like uh, as assumptions about gender roles, work, family, fertility, immigration, and life starts to shift. And to help us do that, we have three innovative thinkers here today, and I'm just thrilled to present them to you. Eliza Mundy, um, Bridget Schulte, and, and Phil Longman to speak, and then we'll open it up to your questions. Eliza Mundy is a Schwartz Fellow. She'll speak first here at the New America Foundation, and a gender um, and work family expert. She's the author of The Richer Sex. You know, in college, I was actually voted most likely to be on the cover of Time magazine in my college, but the closest I've come is buying uh, one of the magazines that featured Liza on the cover uh, with her new book, as, as in March, Time featured her book about how the new majority of female breadwinners is transforming our family's sex and love. Then Bridget Schulte will speak. She's a Schwartz Fellow here at New America, an expert on family uh, work-life balance and conflict. And her book, Overwhelmed, uh, will be another groundbreaking book here that we look forward to. And I understand she's had recently come back from Europe on a fact-finding trip and will share her thoughts on uh, of that with us. And Phil Longman, one of my favorite thinkers and writers about uh, demography and family for a long time and also a senior research fellow here at New America and author of The Empty Cradle. So I'll invite uh, Liza and uh, Bridget and Phil to come forward and sit here and um, uh, please join me in welcoming them and we'll begin with Liza, please. start the clock the clock starts okay yep so thank you so much for coming um, I'm Liza Mundy uh, and I um, I'm really happy to be here and happy to be a fellow at New America I am a longtime reporter for the Washington Post I'm the mother of two teenage children a boy and a girl I have um, certainly experienced the overwhelmed uh, feeling um, that Bridget will talk about and uh, have worked part-time at, at various times and full-time at various times, and of course it always feels like overtime. Um, and, and so I um, have, well, I'll just call your attention to sort of two recent interesting um, little items. The cover of The New Yorker that I just got has a young woman with a stroller entering a park full of uh, what I assume are part-time working or stay-at-home fathers. Um, so a young woman with a stroller confronting this apparent new world of, of engaged, hands-on dads pushing strollers. And I thought that was interesting just to sort of remind us that that is very much in the, in the air. And then um, about a week ago, the Pew Research Center, which just keeps producing incredibly interesting reports about family, reported that in a reversal of traditional gender roles, young women now surpass young men in the importance they place on having a high paying career or profession, um, which is a really interesting change. And um, both of these relate to the research that I did for my book, The Richer Sex. Uh, and I guess I'll just talk a little bit about how I became interested in this topic. I had been interested for about six or seven years in these incremental news reports about the fact that women now outnumber men on college campuses. Um, women are taking, uh, well, between 55 and 60 percent of college degrees now, and, um, and they are also taking the majority of associate's degrees, master's, and PhDs. And while there's still a gender wage gap, for sure, and women um, with a college degree still don't make as much as men, that gap is closing. And there was a report out about two years ago uh, that showed that young women in most American cities now who are single and childless make more than their male peers. So there is a really interesting shift going on and um, I guess 
thinking back to my own college experience, I was on a college campus in the 80s where the, the proportions, I think, were about three to one, you know, male to female. So women were very much a, min a minority when I was in college. And the fact that women are in a majority now on university campuses is a really interesting switch, and it's a switch that's taking place all over the world. In most countries now, uh, women are outnumbering men in universities. So, um, you know, how is this going to play out for this generation of young women who are better educated on average than their male peers and may have a higher earning potential than their, than their male peers do? And I was talking to my editor at Simon & Schuster, who is a former editor at Time and very acutely attuned to trends, and she was noticing in her own professional and personal circles more and more women who were out earning their partners and, and you know, having a lot of conversations about the impact that this was or was not having on their relationships. And we started talking about this, and when I started looking into the um, government statistics, I was, well, I was really interested to see, first of all, that there is a Bureau of Labor Statistics table uh, that tracks wives who out-earn husbands. There's not a table for husbands who out-earn wives because presumably that was considered the norm in the late 1980s when they started the table. And what you see when you look at it um, is that you know, back in 1987 when they started, the percentage of working wives who out-earn their husband was about 23%, and it's now uh, close to 40%. And it, it's, and when you look at it, you can see a steady rise, and, and interestingly, you can see kind of a stagnation in the 1990s, but beginning in about 2000, 2001, well before the recession, you can see an acceleration. You can see it jumping about a percentage point every year, and then, you know, in 2009, um, reflecting really sort of the, the, the depths of the recession and, and, and male job loss during the recession, you, it jumps a couple percentage points, so it could slide back a little bit, but, um, but what you see is a steady rise. And with the help of actually people here at New America, I just, I mean, it's not that hard to do. I just, you know, plotted it out. And you can see that if it continues to rise at, at this pace, by about 2030, the percentage of working wives who out earn their husbands would rise above 50%. And um, so, so we could have that benchmark. And we also know that there is a, um, a growing percentage of women who are the breadwinners in their households because they're single moms. I mean, we know that 40% of children now are born to unmarried mothers. So you have this, um, this, this large and, and I think growing group of women who are breadwinners by dint of being the sole earner in their household. Uh, so, you know, we're looking at, I think, a really interesting future in terms of work-family balance and, um, and, and women's increasing economic uh, power um, and, you know, the opportunities and the burdens and responsibilities that come with that. So I tried to do a lot of, um, I, I tried to spread the net really widely in terms of doing personal interviews with women who are living this situation. And it, you know, included women in their 40s and 50s who had just kind of emerged as the more successful partner in their marriage and were sort of surprised by the turn of events because they hadn't necessarily expected it. Um, I interviewed African-American women who have been living this situation for a long time, uh, in large part because the, um, you know, the, the changes in our economy that have affected all men that have um, led to the uh, decline in high-wage jobs for high school graduates have impacted African-American men even more. So African-American women have been breadwinners for a longer period of time. Um, and, and so I tried to talk to a lot of women about that. I also spent a lot of time with Latina women in Deep South Texas who were also out achieving men at a um, at an even higher rate than women are nationally. So in their community, men would often leave uh, leave after high school and and try to join the workforce, get any job really that they could find. Women are staying in college; they're getting degrees as psycho you know psychology degrees, social workers, teachers, lawyers, and they're emerging as better educated and better equipped to provide in what is really a still very macho community. And so, talking to women about how this affected their dating life and their um, you know in their marriages or their lives as single women because a lot of the women that I interviewed are spending a lot of time together, uh, going out together a lot as single women. They go out dancing. One of them said, you know, we don't even expect 
expect men to come up to us on the dance floor. Um, and these women are in an interesting situation from a work-family balance point of view because they want to stay in that region. They, they often have parents and grandparents who are living there. They often have childcare that's provided by their mother or their grandmother, so they don't actually have a childcare problem. Uh, the women I talked to were very motivated to work. They were very proud of their careers and their and their degrees. Um, and they, a lot of them were single moms, and they, they actually could get along in terms of childcare and work pretty well because they have this extended family of, of women who are, you know, all too happy to, to watch their children during the day. Um, and I spent a lot of time interviewing uh, sort of young college-age women who are part of this generation of kind of supercharged, well-educated, uh, you know, women with, with really unprecedented prospects for earning. Uh, and what I found, I mean, in, in all these interviews, what what really, I mean, one of the many things that struck me is, is I think I would be in the category of women who, for the past 30 or 40 years, really expected and have worked for, you know, parity and, and equality. And you think of that as meaning, okay, in an ideal world, if I'm married, I'll, I'll earn as much as my husband does, because I should, you know, and, and, and I'll work the same number of hours. But also, when we come home, we'll, we'll work the same number of hours at home, and everything will be the same. And that will be the ideal world. And so I find that women and men can be taken aback when, um, when the woman, when it's actually, you don't, it's not equality and parity. It's, actually you find yourself working longer or earning more or becoming the breadwinner in a way that you hadn't necessarily expected. And I found, you know, that men can have a problem with this, but, but women can also have a problem with this uh, and, and, and are forced, I think, to ask themselves a set of new questions. Um, I interviewed one young woman in the San Francisco Bay Area who is a mechanical engineer working in the aerospace community, and, uh, and her husband went back to well, he was her boyfriend at the time, and he went back to work to get went back to school to get his master's. And when he graduated, he was unable to find a job because it was the depths of the recession. And um, so she really found herself uh, becoming the breadwinner unexpectedly. They were obliged to get married sooner than they had expected because um, he needed to get on her health insurance. So they had hoped that they would be able to have this big wedding, invite all their friends, and they found that they couldn't. They had to. They quietly got married so that they would later be able to have a wedding and um, invite all their friends. And she found that uh, she was, you know, very aware of the responsibility of having to support a household, not just herself. She had always expected to support herself, but she had not expected to support a husband and a household. And um, and she did it, and, and she found that the responsibility of being the breadwinner actually led her to work much harder at work. She was already working hard, but she wasn't liking her job that much. In an ideal world, she might have changed jobs, but she felt it was so important to keep this job that she started traveling more. Uh, she started working longer hours. She found that her performance evaluations were improving. She felt better about her job because she was getting these great performance evaluations. But she was having to ask questions like her husband was doing all the work at home. He was doing all the cooking, all the cleaning. He was taking their animals to the vet. And she had to ask herself, well, is that fair? I mean, we've said for 20 or 30 years that if the man is the breadwinner, he's not um, entitled to sit around when he gets home. You know, he has to pitch in. He has to change the diapers. And, he has to, and, and, and she found herself asking, well, you know, when I come home at the end of a long, hard day, couldn't I just sit around a little bit? And, and she didn't – this was a woman who had belonged to the Freedom from Gender Society in college. I mean, she had been a progressive feminist all her life, and she found herself wrestling with what she thought were questions that had been answered long time ago. And even when he went back and got his, he went back, he, he found a job, but he was making only half of what she did. And she found that he was still doing the majority of the work at home. And she was still asking herself, well, you know, maybe that's okay. He's better at these tasks than I am. And so she found herself offering the same justifications that men have, you know, you're better at loading the dishwasher, right? And so you should continue doing it. So um, she was really wrestling with questions as the breadwinner that she had not anticipated asking and she also was asking questions like well if I volunteer to take a travel assignment because I'm the breadwinner do I need to call home and run that by him do I need to see if it's okay or am I entitled just to to go um, and she found that she sometimes would just go I mean that she would sign up without without checking she also had to admit and this is interesting 
when women become breadwinners, studies show that they're more likely to hang on to control over their earnings than men are. That traditionally male breadwinners have handed over their pay packet or most of their pay packet to their spouse and treated this as the household's earnings. Women are still more likely to retain control. And so um, uh, she, she found herself, she admitted that, that when he was staying at home and took one of their animals to the vet and okayed an expensive procedure without clearing it with her, she said, you know, if he had been earning, I think that would have been okay with me. But because he didn't ask me, I felt like, hey, you just spent a bunch of my money without asking me. So she was still thinking of her money as my money. And I think it's because women have been raised to think of our earnings as supplemental, um, as, uh, as sort of pin money. And, and the idea that, no, this is our money, this is our household's money, and um, is, is still something that we're wrapping our minds around. And I spoke to more than one progressive breadwinning wife who, um, who admitted to sort of secret spasms of feeling more entitled to her money than, than her husband or partner. So it was interesting to see these old questions get revived in a new context. One of the things that I also came to um, to, to wonder, as I, I interviewed couples where this was working out really well, I interviewed a family in Michigan of five adult siblings who had been raised by a classic male breadwinning dad. Um, five of the six siblings now are in female earner households. Three of them are heterosexual marriages where the husbands have decided to be just, you know, like this, this guy on the cover. And these are men in their late 40s uh, who've been very happy as a secondary earners, very supportive, run their household really well. Um, one of, the, one of the, the husbands is a statistician by training, and he runs his household just incredibly uh, like that. And, and, you know, has the appointment calendar. I mean, he is not overwhelmed. And, and he has laundry day. And, and uh, his wife said that he, um, one year he tried to, uh, he, he wanted to do a statistical analysis of trick-or-treaters so he could gauge how much candy to buy the next year. <laughs> Only he decided in the end that there were too many unpredictable variables like the weather. So it was not a valid experiment, but they tried it for a couple of years. But this is the sort of running of the household that he does, and it works for their family. And these women have been able to really rise in their workplaces because they are so supported by husbands who are very happy in their secondary earner or non-earning role. And it did make me wonder, and I I'm interested, you know, to know what all of you think about this, that the old-fashioned specialization model of one person as the primary earner and one person as the secondary earner or non-earner, if you're going to have a family, you know, that maybe it's more valid than we thought, and maybe for women to really rise to the top, maybe that's what it's going to take. And I did, I don't know if that's the answer, but I did find myself asking if, if maybe sometimes we're going to have to dial back on this expectation of exact equality, like a husband and wife who are mirror images of each other and tolerate the idea that maybe one person is going to be need to be the one to pull ahead if you really want to succeed in a high-powered workplace and you want to have a family. So that was a question that I found myself wondering um, as I was um, doing my reporting. So thanks. Sure. Okay. Is that, is that on? Okay. Hey, everybody. I'm Bridget Schulte, and like Liza, I'm also a longtime reporter at the Washington Post and um, have been on leave and a fellow here at New America. Uh, very grateful as well to have the kind of um, amazing thinking uh, power and um, uh, just really uh, smart and thoughtful people around here to help support the work. Um, my journey was a, was a little different. Um, I uh, was part of a, uh, an internal working group at the Washington Post. We were looking at our readership numbers. And, um, you know, over years, over the, you know, obviously newspaper readership has been in decline as people have migrated over to online and digital reading. This was a couple years ago, I think, before we fully embraced, you know, the clicks and, you know, let's go digital. And so we were looking at, well, uh, at the readership numbers. And in this demographic that... Um, that our research folks called frenetic families, they were noticing that there was a big gap between men and women um, in sort of the 18 to 34, 18 to 44 age range. And 
so they appointed this committee to figure out you know what's going on and so all of the people appointed to the committee were women and we all looked around at each other and most of us were working mothers or um, uh, had a really hard time getting up in the morning and getting the kids out the door and oh my god I forgot the Girl Scout forms and here's your $11 for your you know uh, school photos I'm just describing last week and um, you know getting the kids out the door well you know my husband would you know very leisurely read the newspaper uh, and so we looked around and we said you know we're really busy and we have a hard time ourselves reading the newspaper in the morning and we work for the newspaper so uh, that's not a good thing um, uh, so we figured women are just too busy and somebody said, well, isn't there a time, aren't there time studies? Don't people do like how we use our time and, uh, you know, isn't there something that would show how busy mothers are? Um, and I said, you know, cause we were reporters and we wanted this report to be very, you know, fact-based and evident, evidentiary. And I said, yeah, I don't know. I'll look. So, uh, with absolutely no more background than, uh, the ability to call up Google, uh, I, I did time busy mother and up pops a time use researcher. And so I figured, oh, I'll give him a call. He's at the University of Maryland, it's a local call. So I give him a call and I said, you know, we're doing this, we're looking at why women don't seem to not be reading the newspaper to the extent that they used to and not to the extent that men are, uh, even though those numbers were dropping as well. And we just figured mothers are too busy. And he said, wrong, mothers aren't too busy. Mothers have 30 hours of leisure a week. They have more leisure now than they did in the 1960s, even though more of them are in the marketplace. And I said, yeah, like nearly three-fourths are in the marketplace. You, you know, um, I said, I don't know what you're talking about. You're nuts. I don't have 30 hours of leisure a week. I kind of did a quick little file. It's like, okay, yoga class, all right, uh, hour and 15 minutes. Okay, the one night I was surfing the web late at night and ended up with a solitaire game. Okay, busted. Um, but, you know, that up, added up to maybe, you know, and then there's the weekend, but that's running kids around, and that's, a, oh, my, we forgot the birthday present for this thing, and, you know, it was kind of craziness, which I didn't consider. You know, the Greeks said pure leisure is that place where you refresh the soul. That's where you become, you know, you are the most human. And I thought, I don't think I had 30 hours or even an hour of that. And uh, I said, you know, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't have 30 hours of leisure. And he said, yes, you do. Come and do a time study with me, and I will show you where your leisure is. And so I marched into this women's group the next day and said, can you believe what this man just told me? And one of the, um, one of the people on the committee was also an editor at the Washington Post magazine and said, go do the time study and then write about it for me. And so a year and a half later, I got around to tracking my time. And I had the hardest time. He, uh, this time use researcher gave me this template. It's what they use at um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, puts out the American Time Use Survey every year. And it's, it's primarily for economists, although sociologists t like to use it to try to tell us more about ourselves. It's not really very useful to psychologists who go deeper and tend to have smaller sample sizes but get more interesting <laughs> results. Um, so he, so it's this template, and you're supposed to, from midnight to midnight, write what you did and who you were with and label it. Is it sleep? Is it personal care? Is it, you know, child care? Is it, uh, you know, is it leisure? And so I was having the hardest time trying to figure out what my time meant. So I called him up at one point and said, all right, I'm at work. So that's work. And I'm on hold with the pharmacy to refill my son's EpiPen prescription. So that's child care. And I'm surfing the web to try to figure out how to get my brother-in-law's ashes back from China. So I don't know what that is. Uh, and I'm eating my lunch while I'm doing it. So how do I label this time? And, uh, and he just said, oh, keep a diary and I'll, and I'll figure it out. And I think what, what that one instance really, uh, to me, really symbolizes is how, uh, how so many of us live, where it's just kind of coming at you all at once, all the time, and particularly for mothers who are still considered the primary, if not solo, caregiver. Uh, because uh, when women entered the workforce in the early 1970s, um, their lives changed, and very little changed around it. And I, I, I can certainly get into that. Um, uh, but generally, I'll just, fin to finish up that story, I, I did, I started carrying these little books around and noting my time, and because I'm a writer, I would start writing about how I felt about things. It's like, uh, you know, getting coffee because we'd run out again. It's like, who are these people at Starbucks in the afternoon with all this time? You know, <laughs> I'm so jealous. Uh, and uh, uh, 
so he finally, I did type up one week, and it was so laborious and it took so much time, I didn't type up any other weeks. I, I gathered about six weeks' worth of data. And uh, he went through it with a yellow highlighter. <laughs> and one by one, he found what he considered 27 hours of leisure. And it included things like laying in bed for 20 minutes, listening to NPR in the morning, being exhausted and trying to get out of bed. And I said, uh, I was tired. And he said, well, you're listening to the radio. That's technically leisure. Um, anytime I got exercise, went for a run. And I said, well, I, I, I need that for my head. You know, that's more personal care. It's like, no, that's leisure. So that was also leisure. Uh, and I think the, the, the big um, uh, divergence in our opinions about, you know, you know, that kind of Grecian ideal and, you know, how the time use researchers consider it came when I was picking my daughter up from a ballet class and uh, the car broke down and we were stuck on the side of the road for two hours waiting for a tow truck. And out came that yellow highlighter. And I said, you're kidding me. That's leisure. Oh, oh, yeah, that's right. You were with your daughter. So that's child care. So if my daughter wasn't there, that would be leisure time. I was like, yeah. And I said, well, that didn't feel very leisurely. He said, uh, I measure time. I'm not a chronotherapist. You know, and the, imp and the implication being, you know, you have this time. Figure it out. If you don't feel refreshed, it's your own fault. It's kind of blame the woman kind of thing, and which, uh, as I began looking into this, you find all over the place. Um, so this started me on a journey. I, I, wrote, um, I wrote a magazine piece, and I was very worried that I would be exposing myself to the world as a neurotic, disorganized mess. And, uh, and I told my editor, I said, I will be honest to the point of not getting fired. Because I was, it, you know, my life felt really crazy. I, I d ended up describing it like time confetti. You know, you're just shifting all the time between work and home, and, you know, you're, you're you know, you've got the babysitter all lined up and you think your child care is all set up and then you're about to go off to go interview a Somali war criminal and she calls you up and like, oh, I forgot, uh, I'm supposed to go to the optometrist today so I can't pick up your daughter. It's like, I can't either, you know. So just kind of living in this sort of state of breathlessness where things can so easily fall apart. Uh, and I have resources, you know, and there, when you kind of go further down the income ladder, there are far more kind of life and death situations that, you know, a situation like that could end up getting you fired if you're not able to uh, show up at work or get your child care together. So there are, um, you know, so I began, uh, when, I, when I wrote the story, uh, I think what shocked me is I was flooded with emails. And uh, some of them, actually, the, the comments on the public section of the Washington Post were all pretty nasty. You know, oh, you're an idiot. You don't know what you're doing. And uh, you don't really love your children because you're a working mother. And uh, you tend to get that a lot if you're a working mother. Um, you really should be home and um, not trying to have a big house. So, well, it's not that big. The mortgage is big. But... Um, <laughs> Uh, but what sh what shocked me was all of the personal emails that I got from people, and many of them were uh, said things like, "You climbed into my head and you wrote about my life." And I think what surprised me about that is that I had felt so isolated and so alone in that sense of being overwhelmed, and I was shocked at how largely universal it was. I got messages from people, you'd think, oh, maybe it's just type A's on the coast. No, it was people from, you know, middle America. It was men, it was women, it was older, it was younger. It was, it were, um, some of the most heartfelt ones were young women who um, wanted to be doctors, wanted to have careers like the people that Liza talked to and were really afraid to start a family because they had seen people my age and they had seen sort of an older generation kind of burning their candle at both ends and out the middle and just not wanting that for their life. Um, so I began looking, I, I, I began working on this uh, book project and uh, I wanted to look at this in a structural sense. If so many of us felt this way, why? Where was this sense of overwhelm coming from? Um, and and how could it be better? Were there solutions out there? And, you know, I didn't want it to be, I mean, God love her. I love Oprah, and I love Oprah Magazine. But, you know, how many times have you walked along the newsstand and you said, 10 ways to take back your time and, you know, more me time. I mean, you know, it's something that we all yearn for, and we all know that those are sort of platitudes and kind of time management tips that, you know, certainly help. I, I don't want to, you know, diss them, but I think that if it were that easy, 
uh, if there were just 10 things that we could all do, I don't think that you would find things like we do in the general social survey. They've been asking a question for 40 years, like how rushed do you feel? Do you feel like you have enough time in a day to do everything you need to do at work and everything you need to do at home? And um, what's interesting is uh, large majorities of the U.S. population say, no, I don't have that kind of time. I always feel pressure. Uh, and more women than men feel that way. And the curve of women feeling that way is much steeper. It's sort of statistically significant. Um, it's much steeper than for men. Um, you'll also look at the general social survey, the happiness question, which again is self-reported and very subjective, but it's an interesting measure that at the same time women's happiness has also decreased. Um, so there's really something going on. And I began to want to look structurally. And you can't really look, look at leisure like why we, you know, why we feel like we don't have this kind of time to refresh our soul, unless you look at how things work at the home and who's doing what, and and you can't really look at the home without looking at the workplace. Um, and so I, I think that Liza's doing her book is amazing. It's wonderful. I would recommend it to all of you. Um, where I, I sort of pick up after the after the baby comes, um, as sort of once it's once a family's formed, and uh, these really fascinating trends. I think it's really early. Um, it's not showing up in the data yet. It'll be really interesting to see what happens um, in the future. But um, uh, I can tell you, <laughs> like right now, we are really out of whack. We are out of whack at work. We are out of whack at home. And we are definitely out of whack in leisure or, or free time. So I wanted to look structurally what's going on in this larger sense and also internally. Kind of what are those 10 things that you could do? What, what, what piece of it do you, do you own? So I think it's really interesting in talking about, you know, we were talking about the workforce and work and family issues. Um, and a lot of times you, you tend to think that these are women's issues. And I'm here today and I want to talk about men because, uh, what I'm finding is that that's really the key. That's really the key to the future. One researcher that I spoke to said, you know, women have changed as much as they can. It's time for the rest of the world to change. Uh, because when you think about it, um, women entered the workforce, again, in the 70s. And um, what changed about the workforce? Well, we have an Anti-Pregnancy Discrimination Act that went into effect in the 1970s. And I went to an EEOC hearing in February, and it would curl your toes how much pregnancy discrimination is still out there. People getting fired once they tell their bosses, you know, I'm pregnant. This tends to happen in more of the lower income, uh, low wage work working jobs. Uh, there's one woman who studies these uh, statistics and said, you have no idea how many times the word abortion comes up. Because uh, oftentimes women who work, uh, you know, as drivers or in bakeries or um, kind of the lower wage jobs, there are a number of instances where they've gone in to tell their employer they're pregnant and the employer says, choose, you know, your job or your baby. Um, which is pretty amazing when you think that it's, uh, you know, we're a, we're a nation that, you know, with family values. And that's something that we, uh, that we say that we, um, uh, you know, uh, that we value. Um, uh, but I have two stories that I want to share with you. Um, uh, the first is um, and to, to sort of talk about why men are so important in sort of the next stage of, of really getting change and uh, moving toward equity. Uh, fluidity might be the better way to say it. Uh, you know, people shifting roles, kind of moving out of very rigid traditional gender roles that have sort of where everybody's kind of stuck. And one of the reasons that we're stuck when you look at the workplace is because most of the workplace culture is still very much set in the 1950s when you had uh, the, the, the idea is that we had uh, all these June Cleaver, Leave it to Beaver families. In reality, that was really never more than about half of U.S. families that had a breadwinner and a stay-at-home. Uh, parent taking care of all the family and house re responsibilities, and yet that's sort of our uh, nostalgic view of who we were, who we who we should be. That's a that's a very powerful notion for a lot of us. And the workplace, um, the the culture, the norms is still very much what researchers call the centered around the ideal worker, someone who can work twenty four seven at the drop of a hat, fly off to wherever you need to go because you've got someone else taking care of your, your family responsibilities. You don't, you're unencumbered by those kinds of burdens. Um, and when you think about that, when women entered the workforce, the idea was, and the feminists were pushing the idea, we don't want any special favors. We want to compete on an even playing field, which is a really noble idea. Um, but then it, what would, had to have happened at the same time, which has not happened, is the, new, the recognition that then it's families that have children. It's not just, you can't expect a woman to work like a man and, 
out the you know then the idea would be that what you outsource everything else to someone else you pay for and we've done some of that you you look at um, studies you know if you have the resources you pay for someone to come clean your house um, but when you come when it comes to child care that's still something that um, I would argue uh, most people don't want to outsource entirely um, we still have uh, 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 kind of a, another competing trend I've oh my god I've only got two minutes left and I've, I've only gotten to the second point I was going to make so briefly I'll just since I wanted to talk about men um, the two stories I wanted to tell you is about um, uh, a, a lawyer named Ariel Ayana and what he uh, what he his story signifies is what researchers finding uh, they're calling it the male flexibility stigma that because we've got these ideal worker norms in the workplace um, any kind of flexibility when you look at those kinds of programs they tended to come out of women's initiatives oh my goodness we're losing women you know if you look at some of the opt-out statistics um, there was some research that was done that showed you know yes you've got these equal graduation rates or women uh, graduating at greater rates than men that's been the case for several several decades actually in certain fields but then you look 15 years out 30 percent of the women MBAs are gone 25 percent of the women lawyers are gone um, and why? Uh, there's a, a number of different reasons, but a lot of it is because that's the time you form the family, and you've got workplaces that are expecting you to work uh, uh, in a way as if you didn't have a family, and that's just not a choice that women have been willing to make, or many of them. Um, uh, so Ariel Ayana uh, was, uh, worked for a law firm. His wife um, had uh, some uh, difficulties, mental breakdown, two young children. He applied for using his uh, federally, the one, the one federal policy that we have uh, to support families, the Family Medical Leave Act. And he started to, um, you know, he took some time off so he could take care of their two children and get child care arranged and take care of his wife. And that so went against the culture of his law firm. This was in Boston. Um, he got comments like, well, you know, that's for women. You know, why are you taking this? And when he came back to work, um, uh, things went from bad to worse, and he wound up being fired. And now he is suing his old law firm under a new kind of theory of law called family responsibilities discrimination, which is really fascinating and what some people think is the only way to really move that culture in the workforce. Uh, and I'll leave you with one last story. A different lawyer, different firm, wants to blow up the idea of billable hours, wants to make work and life work for not just families, not just women, but for men, for fathers who want to be more involved at home, for people who want to go back to school, for people who want to live in Maine and go hiking in the middle of the day. Um, and he is living in Maine. He had just gotten back from uh, his uh, you know, son's activity at school. Uh, I called him up. It's like, oh, the refrigerator repairman's coming. Uh, can I call you back in five? And I thought, this is a guy. Yeah. Um, dogs are barking in the background, and he's doing high-level uh, corporate law and being very successful. So there are bright spots out there. Thank you. So I come at this set of issues from a slightly different place. I, I, uh, I'm a father, I'm a husband. Um, um, but uh, the way I got interested in this wasn't so much personal as, as paying attention to broader scale demographic trends in the world. Um, and so I'm going to start off talking about some, some, some really high level global uh, phenomenon, megatrends, um, but worry not because I'm going to end up in the bedroom. Um, <laughs> so from macro to micro. Um, so briefly, uh, the big picture on human population today is not what the average man in the street tends to think. Uh, we have passed, uh, most of us grew up with this idea of the population bomb in our head. Um, and uh, in the 1970s and such, the world population was growing very quickly. But a dramatic change that transcends cultures, transcends classes, you know, has, has really overtaken the world in the last generation. And, and that is this tremendous decline in, in birth rates um, that 
began in uh, Western Europe um, and then spread uh, throughout the world um, to the point where now every developed country um, no longer produces enough children to uh, replace the current population. Um, coincidental with this is, of course, a great aging of the population because you're having fewer children and yet you have people already born <laughs> staying with us. Um, and so uh, this is more and more becoming to define our world, this, this global aging that is the result not so much of people living longer as them, ha as them having many fewer children. Um, we used to associate this with um, affluence and education, um, but we are now seeing this trend spread uh, to places that are not affluent um, uh, nor secular. Um, so Iran, for example, now has a, a well below sub-replacement fertility rate. Brazil, uh, southern India, uh, all of China, um, basically all of Asia except the Philippines, um, uh, all of the former Soviet Union, um, Mexico uh, is now just right on the verge. Uh, so this is, this is a real sea change. Um, and obviously has a lot to do with the relationship between men and women and the, the contract, as it were, between men and women. Um, now, turning to the United States, uh, we have generally so far avoided this trend um, to anywhere near the extent that it has visited Europe or Japan. Um, our birth rate is still close to um, replacement rate. It's, it's slightly below. Um, but we seem to be on the threshold of a, a world in which uh, it is, we're probably going to catch this meme too. Um, first thing is uh, just the most recent data points show a, a dramatic decline in, in fertility in the United States just in the last two years. Um, no doubt having a lot to do with um, the Great Depression and the uh, recession and the uh, and the pressures that's put on, on couples. Um, but we are also seeing at the same time a, a dramatic decline in, in immigration, um, driven partly by the uh, almost near collapse of birth rates in Mexico and the rest of Latin America, and also by the diminishing um, economic opportunities available to uh, low-skilled migrants um, in the United States as the housing bubble. Um, has burst, and so we're now looking at uh, new data points that suggest that we, we may actually be looking at uh, negative net immigration uh, with Mexico. Um, I think one of the things our children will wonder about us the most is what was this wall all about? What was that for? Um, so bold new changes in, in human population. Um, now, the causes of this, would, we could talk for days, right? Um, but obviously, it, it does have ultimately have to do with um, sex and reproduction and relationships between men and, and women. Um, in the American context, you know, I'm in looking very closely at, at what, uh, what is this generation now in its 20s thinking about parenthood and about marriage and about career and how does that fit into this larger picture I'm, I'm painting. Um, and there I think we get um, so a real interesting picture that I think is sometimes hard for uh, baby boomers like me to absorb because it, it kind of transcends normal categories of thought in, in baby boomer world. Um, so one big trend is the one that Liza already mentioned, um, which is this increase in, in careerism among uh, younger women and in educational attainment um, to the point where, you know, we're actually beginning to see uh, well-educated, young, single, childless women um, make eight to nine percent more um, than their male counterparts. Um, we, at the same time, see a a strengthening desire to marry, um, um, particularly among women. Um, this is a dramatic change in, in younger women. 
uh, when you ask them, you know, rank how important the following things are to you, your conception of the good life, realizing the American dream. And marriage um, is way at the top and rising fast. Um, so you have simultaneously this new careerism and this new idea of marriage. Um, Another thing, though, that is very different is that although young men are also expressing more um, desire to marry, the gap between the percentage of men who rank marriage as very important and the percentage of women who do is widening. So you have simultaneously an increasing um, disparity in educational and, uh, attainment and often income um, and um, competing visions of, of what the good life is. So men are comparatively less interested in getting married. Um, now, I next place I'm going to go, I, I know it's a little bit um, touchy because I had a breakfast conversation with my wife this morning, and it became quite animated both the end. <laughs> but I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start off talking about not our own culture in, in hopes that it won't be as inflammatory. I'm going to talk about other people's stereotypes. Um, and, um, people, you know, particularly and focusing on Japan and, and South Korea. Now, th those are two countries that are distinguished in having the lowest birth rates on Earth right now. Um, about average Japanese woman uh, estimated to have about 1.3 children over her lifetime, uh, whereas she would need to have 2.1 to replace the population. So Japan is already shrinking in absolute size of population and, of course, aging at a tremendous rate. Um, now, <clears throat> when you talk to young Japanese folks about what's, what's going on, right, with you guys, <laughs> um, here's the picture I get. Um, f starting from the, well, let's start from the, the female point of view, right? Um, the female point of view um, in the last generation was we don't re we really don't like the world as we find it because we find ourselves married to these salary men who come home late at night drunk and pay no attention to us or to the kids and so uh, we're really unhappy with that and we have no aspiration to, to live that life um, and also certain lingering Confucian values would play a role here, like the Confucian norm that uh, if you marry a man, you become responsible for your mother-in-law's health, right? Which just comes up a lot in focus groups, right? Um, but now I think younger women, when they, when they look across the gender divide, they, they, see, they don't see that salary man there anymore. They see a completely different type of guy who's young. Um, and that, that guy is, the first thing to know about him is he's addicted to video games. The next thing to know about him is he's, he's addicted, addicted to, to internet porn, and, and he's addicted, uh, and he's living with his parents. Um, and he's really not that into you, <laughs> right? He's got other, he's kind of comfortable where he is. He doesn't have a, a sexual imperative uh, thanks to the internet porn um, that um, I, th I like to think my generation had, um, so there, that's kind of off the table, right? And and um, materially, uh, kind of comfortable living with mom and dad. Um, you know, she does the socks and all that. Um, would probably be interested if a woman came along who said, "You know what? I'm a really high-powered woman. I make a lot of money, and I I would support you in your." video addiction, <laughs> should you like to marry me? He probably, you know, take that um, proposition. But he's not obviously very attractive to the opposite sex, <laughs> right? Because he's not really offering much, right? Um, and so the opposite sex has, has, has evolved into a new stereotype that's very prominent in Japan, uh, which sort of translates as the, the parasite single. Uh, is the negative characterization of this new stereotype, which is this is the young career woman uh, who may not have um, a particularly illustrious career, but it's still kind of exciting that she has a career at all because in Japan, feminism, that sort of thing came much later. Um, she's living with her parents too. So she has a lot of discretionary income. 
Um, and she uses her free time to do things like take weekend vacations to Hawaii and buy shoes in the stereotype, right? Um, so she's, she's looking at, at men thinking, well, or potential marriage partners thinking, well, I, you know, they're not very sexy, they're not very interesting, they don't offer any protection or, or, or provision, and I'm kind of happy doing what I am with the, the shoes thing in Hawaii, right? Uh, and so you get to this point where both sexes are just kind of looking across the table at each other and saying, I'm not that into you. Um, and I see that as a something that is really um, a powerful force in the world. Japan is an extreme example, but I think we can all recognize elements in the United States, in the younger generation, where that that rings true. Um, and so the question is, you know, what happens next, right? Does this generation wind up getting married? Do they wind up having children? Uh, when they do, what's the division of labor? The kind of issues you've been talking about. Um, but I see, I see a kind of train wreck, because I see this combination of, of, of higher, higher aspirations to marry um, combined with all sorts of circumstances that make marriage extremely problematic even to get to the altar. Um, now, let's just say one final thing about um, sort of the psychodynamics of younger generations, romantic and sexual thinking, right? Um, which, um, and this is also kind of hard to get your head around, but um, you have simultaneously, I, I think in, in, in the younger, in America, um, abundant re uh, polls and research showing that um, tolerance of other people's alternative lifestyles, if you will, is way on the rise. So uh, gay marriage, for example, polls enormously higher among young people than it does among older people. Right, tolerance for out of wedlock birth, extremely high. Conception of what a family is, much more expansive than traditional generations, um, right? Um, but this is combined with another tr uh, trait of mind which is exceptionally risk averse. Um, so that as, in terms of how I personally conduct my life, right, I, I, will, I, I am not going to take risks. Right, so even even casual sex is way on the decline among teens, and when they have sex, they have redundant prophylactic devices. Right, sex with your galoshes on, right, <laughs> right, um, and then of course the the pressure, the time pressure, and the career pressure on both to graduate. Um, so the way this is kind of sorting out so far is. Um, for the great mass of Americans, uh, marriage is getting farther and farther out of reach. So last year, uh, the, the percentage of Americans who were married reached an all-time low, right? Um, and within the lower middle class, uh, marriage is getting passingly rare. Um, uh, you know, 40% of our children now are born out of wedlock, right? But what you're seeing simultaneously is in the upper middle class, among people who have means and advantage in life, that they are figuring it out. And that the prestige of marriage is actually rising, right? And the divorce rate is going down, right? And commitment to children is going up, right? And, and so to the extent the upper middle class sets the tone in society, right? We can look to a world in which marriage will be extremely more prestigious. Right, and, and maybe even stay-at-home moms will be extremely prestigious because it's so hard to be one, um, and economically. Um, but at the same time, you know, a gigantic percentage of the population um, feeling um, romantically thwarted, not ever having the children that they hope to have, ne never having the, the marriage that they hope to have. So those are my thoughts on the, the big picture, where we are. We can talk about what it all means later. <laughs> That's great. I told you these three were extremely interesting. Let me ask a quick question of each and we'll open up for the floor. Uh, Liza, I just was interested in, it's 2030 that the breadwinning uh, division switches, that's the tipping point that is the year. Just be curious to, uh, I'll just ask all three questions first, but we'll start with Liza, just to think about if you think that is going to uh, happen directly or do you think uh, between now and then 
factors in between are likely to extend that time or shrink it, or what would, how should we think about what would get in the way of that number on either, in either direction? Bridget, to, to give you just a chance to talk more about men, uh, uh, either some of the statistics that, you know, Family and Work Institute around the stress that men are feeling, or more about this family responsibility uh, tort claim or whatever it is, I, would be interesting, but just a chance to expand. And then, Phil, uh, do you see anything that is happening globally that is uh, being successful in terms of stemming the tide towards declining fertility uh, that we should think about in this country or that other countries should replicate? Liza. Yes, yeah, so I thought a lot about this. You know, what would stop that, um, that graph from continuing to rise, that line? And, and, and I think, you know, ch the economy is changing. It's changing in a way that rewards educated workers. We know that. So if women are increasingly the educated workers, um, I don't, I, I, unless, unless somehow we reverted back to a manufacturing economy that with the, with the high wages for high school graduates, I, I don't know that that would happen. Um, it, certainly, we, if, if we figure out a way to get uh, the men who in another generation would have been the high wage high school graduate industrial workers, if we figure out a way to get the men back into college or get them into the training that will um, prepare them for a changing economy, then then maybe we could equalize that. The the other, I mean, the interesting question that I asked myself when I would talk to these really aspirational, well-educated young women who apparently do expect a high-paying career or profession, when I would talk to them about their lives um, moving forward, it will be interesting to see whether they are willing to embrace the breadwinning role and whether they are willing to embrace the idea of being the primary earner in their household as they as they wrestle with the responsibilities that come with that. And I was talking to, I interviewed a number of young women whose husbands and boyfriends were really willing to invest in them, invest in their earning potential in a way that women used to invest in their husbands. I mean, in the 1950s and 60s, it was very common for a young woman who went to college to leave after a year or two and get married. So her husband would be the better educated person, and it was common for her to also work to put a husband through medical school or law school. That was the norm. I interviewed young women whose husbands were doing that for them. I interviewed a woman in uh, a law student in Vermont, whose husband is a carpenter, and he was working to put her through law school, you know, to minimize her debt load, and with the understanding between the two of them that she would be the higher earning partner. So he was investing in her potential, and she was good with that. She was fine with that and grateful for it. Um, but I, I interviewed another young woman in Atlanta, a mechanical engineer who was in a PhD program. She was dating a guy also in the PhD program, but she was doing better than he was. And she was more focused. She had a better advisor. She was very successful. She'd had some great summer internships. She was looking at some really terrific job prospects. He was discouraged. He had a really tough advisor. He was thinking he might drop out and just get a master's. He was saying to her, you know, I'll move for you. I'll relocate for you. If you get a job in California, I'll go with you, and then maybe I could get take some time to sort myself out and and figure out what I really want to do. And so you go, girl, and I'll you know I'll not only support you, I'll make the compromises necessary to enable your career. And you know, on the one hand, that's a really important thing for women because one of the things that has um, that has served to depress women's earning capacity in offices is the fact that husbands have traditionally not been as willing to move for a wife. So she can't go to her boss and say, if you don't give me this raise, I'm going to go to California because the boss knows that her family wouldn't move for her. So for women to have partners who will, who will enable them, is a really valuable bargaining tool in the workplace. But she was thinking this through, and she said to herself, you know, getting boxed in as the primary earner sounds to me like a lot more work and a lot less play. So, you know, does she want that? And I had a young woman, I, my book is called The Richer Sex, and she was interviewing, um, I mean, she was introducing me, and, and she said, you know, this is scary. And, and so I thought, you know, I mean, it, it, I, think, it, I think, you know, in an ideal world, we'll have very flexible roles, and we'll just trade back and forth, and we'll understand that, um, you know, whoever is sort of better and in, more inclined to stay home or be the secondary earner, and whoever's more inclined to be the primary earner, it shouldn't matter the gender. But um, it will be interesting to see whether women en masse are willing to embrace the, the idea of being the breadwinner. Okay. 
All right, so you wanted me to talk about men. If I could borrow your New Yorker for a minute, Liza? Nope, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Okay, so here's the picture, right? The men at the playground with uh, the strollers. Well, I just got back from a research trip to Denmark and Sweden, and I saw this. I saw this everywhere. I saw men with those gigantic baby buggery strollers in the middle of the day on a weekday. You know, you see men with strollers. I'm, I'm not going to diss American men. American men have, have made enormous strides in the last couple of decades. But you tend to see them on the weekends with their kids. And you tend to see them with their spouses. I saw lots of solo dads um, just walking on the street you know, on, a, on, a, on a pathway that had like a, you know, how they just have the outlines on the, to, to say that there's children walking. Um, you know, usually here we would have a picture of a mom and a, a holding a hand with the kid. In Sweden, there were dads, a picture of the dad holding the kid's hand. Um, just very different norms. Um, one of the things that I discovered uh, is that in Denmark they have a governmental ministry, um, a ministry of gender equity. And this is an important goal for them. In Sweden, uh, in the late 1960s, their prime minister went to the United Nations and said, gender equity is a huge priority for us, and we are going to basically socially engineer it. Uh, there was really nothing different in, in, the, in a sense um, decades and decades ago when it came to traditional gender roles. Uh, men worked, women were considered the, the primary caregiver, and it's still largely that way, uh, largely because they've got long, long maternity leaves that they started in about the 70s. Uh, very generous, long maternity leaves, and what they found over time is while that might have been really great for the kids, it also tended to freeze those traditional gender roles because women in those countries, um, uh, they tend to be more in public sector jobs. They tend not to earn as much money as men, so they do have very much the secondary career. So they began to want to try to change that, and they tried to encourage men to take paternity leave or parental leave. And they came up with different sort of levers, if you will, to try to force that to happen. And initially, they gave more time. Well, none of the men would take it. Then they gave uh, more money, and none of the men would take it. And then they came up with this use it or lose it strategy, where they gave a family a certain amount of time, and they said, okay, and these are the two dedicated daddy months, is what they can you know, sort of call it. Um, and if the dad doesn't take it, the family loses it. So then that began to force some change. And now you've got a majority of fathers in both Denmark and Sweden who take solo parental leave, some quite long. And the interesting thing is what they're finding is then that ultimately, when you give a father solo time with an infant, they develop through time. They begin to understand those cues. They develop the competence to become a more competent and confident caregiver, which then changes that gender dynamic at home, which then also changes the gender dynamic at work, and it changes the relationship with the children. And what's interesting is what, what we've got here with, with our uh, cultural norms, and we do have you know, this very anemic Family Medical Leave Act that, you know, the statistics will show mostly women take maternity leave here. Um, fathers, even though that there are policies, um, it's sort of known in many you know, many places as the kiss of death if you actually do take it uh, when you talk with, with workers or those show up on, on employee surveys where the employer will say, oh, we've got these great policies. And then the employee surveys is like, yeah, but you know, you better not take them. So there's a real disconnect between the lip service and the actual um, uh, take up rate. But what's, what's very interesting is I was talking to a time use researcher in Denmark and because they made that kind of the, you know, the, the social lever changes and because of those um, changes early on with fathers being more involved, they're finding that men's work hours are decreasing and their time at home doing childcare and housework is increasing. At the same time, women's work hours doing paid work is increasing and is sort of the mirror image. Their uh, childcare and housework hours are decreasing. And so I brought my notebook because I couldn't, I couldn't remember exactly the dates, but he's predicting complete gender convergence or equity by the year 2023 in the household. And um, that to, and a complete convergence in the labor market uh, by 2033. Now, and that's that's assuming that the the con current trends continue. And who knows what you know what the future will hold? But that's fascinating. And I asked, what about the United States, where time use studies will show that women, on average, still do at least twice the housework and three times the child care? It's like, well, you are decades and decades and decades away from that.
Well, point, point of, I can't resist this point of information about Sweden. I, I, I can't point you it's a not peer, perfect. It's not peer, perfect. peer reviewed study, but from casual talk with Swedes, right, particularly men, right, um, there turns out there's a pattern in when men take their paternity leave in Sweden. Um, and you would think that that would be pretty much every month would be have the same number of men taking their paternity leave, right? Because children are born at more rate. But it turns out that the, the great preponderance of men in Sweden taking their paternity leave happens to correspond with the opening of elk hunting season. <laughs> <laughs> so that kind of tells you the limits of the unisex <laughs> vision. Well, yes, um, I know, but what's, what's, but, but, what's wrong uh, with you know, that? No other point. I'm, I'm being do they have it in a Snuggie? Yes, Actually, probably they do, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh, right, right. Yeah. right. Um, they also take up the, the they, child care. They have you know, retroactively. A, well, that's right. And, and, All right. So, Phil, right. And we'll get yeah, to you. So, you asked me what around the world has yeah. worked and not worked in Is raising birth rates. working to stem the tide on. Um, the well, I, 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 I want to present a vision of, of, of basically two ways I see mankind sort of inadvertently solving this problem, right? And, and to, to be real shorthand about it, one, you could call it the Taliban way. And, and the other would be the Swedish way. Um, the Taliban way um, is actually um, much more real than you might think because as humanity as a whole is seeing ever lower birth rates, the one trend that counters that mm -hmm. is among people who we might call in shorthand fundamentalists, mm -hmm. right? So whether you're talking about Israel, or you're talking about the Islamic world, or you're talking about Christian fundamentalists in this country. There's a huge and widening differential. Um, so that those populations are putting more of their children and presumably their ideas and norms into the future. Um, they themselves are having fewer children, but mm -hmm. comparatively less. All right. So on a purely Darwinian evolutionary way, this might be one way this thing gets resolved. The Swedish way, of course, is in shorthand again. To, to, what can we do to smooth over tensions between work and family life? And the Swedish experiment, experience has been uh, that they have invested a tremendous amount of, of public money and propaganda in creating this unisex vision of the world. and, and have managed to get their birth rate up above what it was in the early 90s, but still way below replacement rate. So, um, and it, it is impossible to point to any other country in the world that has succeeded in getting above replacement rate um, with those kind of policies. Um, Northern Europe, which tends to have more of that kind of work at the moment, has higher birth rates than Southern Europe that has less. On the other hand, the United States, which has almost none of that, you know, has a higher birth rate than anywhere. In, in. So it's, it's kind of a big mystery uh, about what will work. But I, I think the beginning of wisdom on this question is, uh, comes to me from work that uh, Catherine Hackham did, who's a uh, researcher in the uh, UK. And, and she is at pains to show um, that we're really sort of asking the wrong question when we ask, uh, what do women want? Um, because uh, it's really kind of an insulting question, as if all women wanted the same thing. And what her research has found is that uh, across the developed world, basically, women divide in, into three big categories. There, there's about 20% of the population that wants a traditional stay-at-home mom type world. Um, there's another 20% of the population that wants career and nothing but, um, which is actually consistent with the, the finding now that about 20% of the population now is winding up childless in, in developed world. Um, and then in the middle is this 60% of women that want some kind of hybridization, right? Um, well, if, if, if you are crafting family policy or pronatal policy, you better pay attention to all three kinds of women, right? Not just one. And so, for example, the Finns have done something very smart, I think, right, which is to not uh, tie child care benefits to institutional child care, that stay-at-home moms in Finland um, receive a stipend or a mother's pension, as it were, uh, for what they do. Um, and um, 
that eases their culture wars, right, and, and takes appropriate accommodation to the real diversity of, of women mm -hmm. and men on this subject. Which is interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, just two anecdotes on your two types of the Swedish Taliban model, just for a second. As I think about the last seven years of work family events here, the party affiliation of the work life researchers who have more than four or more children is almost entirely a Republican. So I think about people who have been on this stage talking work family at these events, not exclusively, but there, there is this interesting build about, about people who have spoken who are work life researchers or advocates, not advocates, researchers uh, who, have more, who have four or more children. They tend to be conservative. I spoke at the, at the Swedish embassy last June and there was a debating about whether or not the U.S. or the Swedish model and afterwards uh, all the embassy, so six embassy employees were just sitting around and this, the female Swedish embassy employees who have had both part of their family raising experience in Sweden and part of it here, all of them preferred the U.S. So they're trying to think about whether they would rather raise their children in Sweden or in the U.S. And all six of the Swedish embassy employees, women, preferred here, which I thought was really interesting. Anyway, that, we can talk more about that. But, but um, uh, so let's, let's have uh, some questions here. So we'll start here. It was fascinating. So they thought about, well, I thought you might ask that, but I didn't want to do it. <laughs> So uh, the thought was basically community focus, that they felt like there was such an individualism uh, over there, a reliance either on the government or an in a, like the carpool mentality here, the, 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 it takes a village, the pitching in and supporting each other culture here where people on the same block help watch the other's kids was absent from their experience. Now, I think one thing that cuts against it a little bit, these were not in, none of these people lived in Stockholm. Like they were, they tended to be less, to be more Swedish suburban or rural than urban. And so I think that undermines the point a little bit. But they thought that there was either that they were impressed by how people pitched in as a community to support each other's uh, child rearing opportunities in the United States, and people carpooled. Like what is carpooling? That was not something they had experienced in Sweden. Like people sort of did their family's thing, and the next family did their family thing. And you sort of, we're relying on the government a bit. I mean, we, we sh we, we're, we're taking our, and I think there's a culture, people will just stereotype a little bit when you go to a party. If you ever gone to a party in Sweden or a Swedish party here, it is less just a stereotype friendly, let's say. It, it's harder to break in culturally as an outsider, uh, uh, people would say. So, so there's a little bit less gregariousness. And I think that is consistent with a thought that would say, uh, you know, people are more community focused in, in, a, in, a, um, in a different kind of way than the U.S. is. That was their experience to me. I, I can't do anything other than relay what I heard. All right, let's we have a question here uh, and we'll start going around here. My name is Lee Yang. I just wonder if you can address some more issues. Now, we are talking about work uh, or other uh, jobs. But to me, they are all jobs that should be paid. And I think at some point in time, in a superwoman, they say you should compensate the household workers. What I mean is a household producer, which is women, you should pay them rather than they got nothing. Okay. So are we going to have the same trend, say we got to reward the housewife for some compensation for their child-bearing or household production. Mm -hmm. And second is uh, the, they say the prisoners, they say uh, Abu Jamal, mm -hmm. who really produce a lot of publication. So whether we should award them or the people prisoners go to production in this uh, literature producing and get some award. And it's, it's the third is the let's keep it. Let's keep it that way. Yeah, one guideline. We'll, we'll, let's go around and ask a question. Then, if we have time, we'll come back to second questions because we'll have that. So we're gonna let's hold on to the first one because it's an important one about compensation for. I mean, Phil and I've talked a lot about this about the people who caregiving. It's the least compens. Let's talk about compensation for caregiving uh, generally. But let's, let's 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 take a couple questions at first, and then we can respond. So who's got a another single question for our panel here? All right, well, let's, let's take a question. We'll come back to the observations, too. Let's, let's, uh, so right here, we'll take these three questions, and then we'll, we'll come back. I'd like to hear the observation, too, but let's. Uh. 
Hi, I'm with the Association for Women in Science. My question is for Bridget. When you said that a lot of the responses you got were from women, young women who wanted to become doctors and they felt like they couldn't um, have children. They felt like they, was, they were just terrified to have a family probably because a lot of that coincides with the tenure clock, et cetera, in academia. And I was wondering if you could share some of those stories with us and just anecdotally um, maybe speak to that a little bit. Okay, and then uh, the lady here was asked a third question and we'll, yeah. On the line. Oh. oh. Hi, my name is Emily. I'm with the National Alliance for Caregiving. I was just kind of interested to get your take on like the sandwich generation or older, like middle-aged women who are caring for their adult parents. Mm -hmm. Because I know like today you could be caring for your adult parent longer than they cared for you with um, people living longer and things along those lines. So I just want anyone on the panel just your general opinions on that. Okay. All right. So we've got three questions here. Let's start with Bridget because one was directed to you here. Uh, the, the second one was, and then see if, if either Phil or, or Liza wants to take either of the other uh, two questions on, on compensation um, uh, and then on, on the elder care. If not, I can talk about elder care, but, but start with Bridget here. Okay. All right. I can be very brief on, on each, each of the three questions. I would say... Well, you can just you take know, one if you want. But yeah, it's, I'll, it's, just, I'll just say in terms of compensating, um, we've got a lot of work to do before we'd ever get to a point like uh, 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 that point. Um, from a societal point of view, although it's worth discussing, um, for in terms of um, you know women in science and doctors, what was interesting, a, a couple things, um, when some of the studies came out um, looking at women, you know the, there was a big argument: are they opting out of the workforce? Are they being forced out of the workforce? But there there was sort of a big discussion. Um, a couple of years ago, when some of these studies that came came out that showed that you know these large cohorts of women, very highly educated from some of the Ivy League schools, disappearing after 15 years, the one sort of bright spot, if you will, were were women who'd gone to medical school, um, fully 15 year in this one study uh, out of the University of Chicago, fully 15 years later, 99 percent of the do women who'd gotten MDs were still in the workforce, hmm. and when they asked anecdotally why. Well, think about it. You get to set your own hours. You have a whole lot more flexibility. You can kind of dial up, dial back, yeah, maybe not much, but more than, say, someone who works in the financial sector yeah. or in a billable hours culture like a, like a law firm. So um, they were finding that women doctors were staying. You'd mentioned the PhDs, because when you look at, um, you know, who's getting the PhDs, even in science, in certain sciences, there are a number of women uh, very well represented, and those numbers have been growing. But then what happens then, who gets tenure? When you look at uh, who gets tenure, it's, um, it's fathers and it's childless women. Uh, uh, you know, it's the mothers who, um, because it coincides right with, uh, like you're saying, the tenure clock coincides right with family formation time. So that there have been some, there's an awful lot of talking about it. Um, you know, there's the, um, uh, projects to retain women attorneys, there's, um, the University of System in California has done some very interesting things. There have been different attempts to try to stop the tenure clock, I open it up for everybody. Can you, you know, can you get a year off? You know, can you can you stop the tenure clock? Um, and I, I think that there have been some some interesting beginnings uh, to try to work on that issue. But I think that's still. Uh, you know, a huge problem. There was just a, a book written by Rachel Conley, who's a labor economist out of Bowdoin, called Professor Mommy. And it was really more of a self-help book saying, you have to try, you have to try to stay in because we're losing so much sort of intellectual capital and so much talent. And we need these ideas to, to have these really full discussions and a, and a really bright academia. All right. Phil, do you have anything? On the well, on the question of paying the people who do all this caregiving for free now. Um, uh, I th I th one competing vision that a lot of people have forgotten about is the competing vision of what used to be called maternal feminism. Um, it is uh, the vision that, for example, Mother Jones had. Mm -hmm. uh, Mother Jones is sort of remembered as this feminist icon, um, but what she was really all about is uh, we would say, you know, enforcing wage discrimination against women, because in her vision, what was h horrible was that you had these capitalists coming in and taking the children and the women out of the house and putting them into the mills and mines, right? 
so her whole progressive era stick was about let's not let the capitalists do that. Mm -hmm. In the next generation of sort of progressive feminist minded women, in uh, you know we had people like Frances Perkins and Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, these are the people who brought you um, the Social Security Act, which if you think about it, was carefully crafted to cr make the world safe for the stay-at-home married mother, right? So we have the spousal benefit that you get, right? It's in the same title, the Social Security Act, we have uh, aid to families for dependent children. That was the old welfare program. In, in the thinking of Eleanor Roosevelt and, and Frances Perkins, nothing could be more obscene, right, than taking women out of the home, mothers out of the home and putting, enforcing them to work, right, while some other woman took care of her children, right? So this was a, a, a version of where the gender contract was in those days. It also included another important concept that's totally forgotten, this buzz phrase of the 1910s uh, called municipal housekeeping. And what municipal housekeeping was, was bright, energetic, well-educated Protestant <laughs> women um, used their energy, through their energy, into social causes, one of them which was prohibition, right? Um, um, but also the great increase in, in just the hygienic standards of, of, of city life that led to such a dramatic decline in infant mortality, right? And this was a role that women, women take. And if you think about Eleanor Roosevelt and her relationship to her husband, right? She was, she was almost the ultimate municipal housekeeper, right? Who eventually wound up addressing the United Nations, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it seems to me that one of the deficits we have in our society today is that whole civic side of life you know, from the, from the PTAs to, to uh, the Girl Scouts to everything that's not market, right, is in deficit. Um, and so it's possible that we could have a new gender division of labor that um, revisited some of those trade-offs that, that those generations made. Thank you. Liza, do you have anything? No, do you need? Um, I mean, I have thoughts swirling yeah. <laughs> based on what they said, but I, I don't know that I need to inflict sure. them on anybody. Sure. Bridget. Just briefly, I, I, no, I wanted, to add, I wanted to add one thing. Again, in Denmark, um, I went to a father's playground. They didn't want to call it a play group because they felt like it was too feminine, but it's a, it was basically a place where dads from all around Copenhagen came and played very roughly with their children. It was very interesting to see, but very quietly. Uh, big bonk on the head, and there was like no, nobody went rushing over or ooey or ah. It was, it was really interesting to see. Uh, but, but one of the things that they do in Denmark is um, if you take care of a certain number of children, you do get paid. So you can be sort of a paid stay at home. You get paid from the government. So it is sort of a way to compensate uh, for child care. But it's not just for your kid. You have to take care of like two or three. I, I just did have one uh, about, the, about sort of um, degrees in uh, careers in medicine. I, I think also... Um, just following up on what you said about medicine, the economist Claudia Golden has done really interesting work showing um, why certain fields in medicine have actually flipped from majority male to majority female. And, and they have. I mean, psychology has flipped to being majority female um, among physicians under 45, pediatrics, general medicine, internal medicine, colo uh, uh, have, have all flipped, um, and veterinary medicine now, cl veterinary medicine classrooms are now m majority female, predominantly female. And one of the interesting things that she's shown is that women can strategically find prof professions that will enable them to continue to work after they have children and to keep their foot in the door. And certain specialties, like veterinary medicine has changed and emergency facilities um, that take after hours work are now standalone facilities. So vet practices are now, the hours are, are more containable. They're more regular and predictable. And so women spot that and they move into that profession because it does offer a more regular schedule. And she's shown that even certain surgical specialties when new procedures are invented that um, enable the surgery to be done in a more predictable time that women gravitate toward those fields. Uh, so anyway, I just thought that was interesting. As we, we'll take the next three questions, starting with the one that was in the back, and then I want to make sure the comment here. But I will just say that the, it's very interesting, the sandwich generation question, uh, where you have all these policies are predicated on the, on the assumption that children were taking care of children. But Phil just indicated we have 
plummeting birth rates globally, and that we have these people living longer, we have uh, this, you know, the sandwich is starting to flip in the other direction. 20% of the population has elder care responsibility now, and that's only going to rise um, for obvious reasons. So let's take the next three questions here. Who's, um, I mean, the, the lady who had her hand up uh, had left before. We'll take Susan's here. So one, two, and then, I mean, the gentleman's over, over here, if we could. Um, thanks for pointing out, I mean, it's very clear that there are many different kind of issues going on here and not one way to solve it. But I wanted to know if you could speak a little bit about what you think our government's role is mm -hmm. in, um, in, in any of these particular issues that have been brought up. Um, and, and, I, and maybe in a, in a way that addresses not just women in academia, who I think actually don't have the hardest brunt of the work family conflict, but maybe a broader spectrum of women mm -hmm. in the US. Okay. Let's just come down and take some questions, and we'll just stack them here. He's got, was there a question here? The gentleman and, and Susan, yeah. <clears throat> I was going to ask um, largely the same thing, just about what changes you would ideally mm -hmm. see in U.S. policy. You mentioned um, the FMLA and sort of what you would change about that if, if you had the power. Mm -hmm. Senate Health Committee is having a hearing on May 10th on some of this, so we'll, we'll hear some ideas. Let's take the... I was uh, wondering, um, I guess, your perspective on uh, the role of GDP, the fact that, you know, the main measure of the success of America is GDP, but it doesn't count household work, it doesn't count work-life balance, it doesn't count so many other aspects like social support. Um, if you think a uh, measure like gross national happiness right, could uh, advance it. Mm -hmm. All right, good. So we'll take the, then let's just keep coming down the line here and just stack all our questions and maybe we'll go through a lightning power round here and end up. Hi, um, I'm Susan Laban, so I'll pose a question to the panel. Um, and it kind of fits in with what some of the other comments were of, of what would we like to see happening. And so um, the vision that I have of, of helping this is to see what we could do about reduced working weeks. Mm -hmm. And this, you know, we had about what kind of changes in the workplace um, could happen. And when I think about, when you talk about the appeal of the Taliban, I lived in North Africa. and you know, many years ago, sort of foresaw this because our concept of modernity is so limited and what are the options that we provide people with are so limited if you care about family and you're in that part of the world. So I'd like each of your take on how that could maybe help the dilemmas of the career breadwinner and the flexibility issues. Okay, and let's see if we have a final, maybe that final question from the lady here. Hi, I have a question about the secondary earner potential and that sort of as a strategic um, decision that couples are now making. I think my generation, you know, you have two either full-time or you have one full-time and one part-time, but there's never this really strategic decision. Who's going to earn a little bit less and then take on a little bit more? And I think that's an interesting evolution maybe that certainly I'd like to hear a little bit more from the panel about. All right, so let's just, as we wrap up here, let's just go down the line here, and we'll, we'll start uh, with Liza. Uh, we've got questions on governmental policy and what the U.S. should be doing, uh, GDP versus other measures, Susan's questions on, on work weeks, et cetera, and, and, and the global piece, uh, and then looking at the secondary earner potential, and, and, and anything that you want to address on that line or, or comments that you felt were unable to uh, get to earlier, let's, let's go down and, and, um, and see what, what feels right to, to talk about. Liza, would you comment on any of those things that you have something to? Yeah, I, I don't know if I'm commenting to any of them directly, but they're, they're all so interesting. I, just the in, in the strategic secondary earner, um, one of the things that really struck me in this, this Michigan group of extended siblings um, is that all of the men had made the decision to be the secondary earner or stay-at-home dad. Um, one of them is a real stay-at-home dad, one of them sells real estate, and the other one had sort of gone in and out of the workforce doing bartending jobs and working in the restaurant industry. All the men had made that decision because they felt as though their work for, workplace was completely unforgiving of fathers. And um, one of the men in particular the one who was a statistician and accountant had been working in financial planning. They wanted him to work 60 or 70 hours a week. He said, I'm not going to do that. My dad did that. I love my dad. He was never around. And I, I, I don't want to be that kind of father. And and they said, that's unacceptable. Uh, he said, you know, I, I, it was just they were in an impasse. And, and um, he said, you know, I'll give you 50 hours a week 
but I won't give you 70 hours a week. And they said, okay, you can dial back to 40 hours a week for as long as it takes you to find another job. And so he did, and he said there was so much unrest in his workplace that he had to actually leave earlier uh, because people were so incensed that somebody was just working 40 hours a week. So how do you address that kind of workplace culture? I mean, uh, the, the, so the men I interviewed had opted out because they had even less workplace flexibility than their wives did. And in that particular family, the wife was working in healthcare for the Henry Ford Health System, and she, I mean, she was very proactive about seeking out flexibility, and she gathered together a group of women, and they made a presentation to their boss for a four-day work week, and she got it. So she actually, in the end, benefited from more, uh, sort of a more flexible attitude from her bosses than her husband did. And she said when her husband went, became the stay-at-home dad, she said it was such a relief. It made family life so much easier on us. You know, we didn't have to both whip out our planner when the kid got sick. Um, you know, I could come home and dinner was made. Uh, you know, he's such, he's so good at running the households that I have weekends. So she didn't feel as though her kids had been neglected. Um, and, and I am in a two-earner household, and I, I thought, God, somebody running the household. What a concept. Um, and so, so it, it was interesting. Now, I would also say that, um, just speaking to the government policy, and there are so many ways to answer that, one of the couples in that family, the husband had been in the restaurant industry, which is extremely demanding. She works in the auto industry, but she works in marketing. And one of the things, and, and she's done incredibly well, she directs global marketing for her company, she travels all the time, but one of the things that drives her husband crazy is he feels like because she's in marketing, she's not compensated the way some of the other sectors in the auto industry that are more male are. are, are, are. And it was interesting listening to them talk about that, because she'll say, well, you know, I mean, in marketing, we're not as important. And I'm thinking, my God, you're in China, you're in Brazil, you're in Europe, I mean, they need you to market their product. How how can you say that you're not as important as the engineers or whatever the guy fields are at your company? And her husband was the one who's saying, you know, she's not being paid what she should be paid. She's the breadwinner in our family. And we definitely still have in the workplace vestiges of this the men are the breadwinners mentality. And so, you know, certainly enforcement of, of, uh, of wage discrimination that does still exist, not just, you know, one-on-one -on -one lawyer versus lawyer, but, you know, why should marketing be paid less than, I don't know, what product development or something? Um, and, and I think, you know, the Obama administration has made some steps toward, uh, toward in, you know, enforcing equal pay laws, but, um, you know, that is still, uh, there, there's clearly still work to be done um, in that in that respect. Thanks, Eliza. Richard. Okay, I know that we're we're short on time, so I'll just um, I'll try to give a big picture, sort of what's what's the vision. You're you're absolutely right when you look at work hours. You know, extreme work hours are on the rise. Mm -hmm. You know, you could you could question how how productive you are. And I'll just go back to when we got the 40-hour work week. Henry Ford. Put, uh, instituted a 40-hour work week on his factory floor. He got a lot of flack. People thought he was crazy. What are you doing? You're giving your workers all this time off. And then a couple of years later, when he, when he was so much more efficient, so much more um, productive, and made a whole lot more money, then everybody else followed suit. Um, there are studies now that show for knowledge workers, which is where we are now, you really aren't very productive after six hours. Um, there's some really interesting work that, you know, the, we have brain waves, we breathe, you know, we kind of pulse. And so that you're, we're, we're much more efficient when we kind of pulse our, our work and we're not just sort of sit in a butt in a chair for 60 hours. You're really not very efficient after that. You know, you're kind of, you're a, you're a warm body. What I would like to see, what's really the answer, is a completely fluid workplace, a very different idea that work is what you do, not where you go, not when you do it, um, that, it that would embrace this sort of fle uh, fluidity, this flexibility for both men and women that would sort of encompass what you're talking about, that there are different things that, that women want, and I would argue different things that men want, sort of a, you know, loosening up. Of, of traditional gender roles. When it comes to, to government policy, um, we are the only OECD country, we are the only developed country in the world that does not have paid parental leave. Uh, I think Sri Lanka and Papua New Guinea are up there with us, um, so we're not in really great company. Um, and yet that was the hard, it was a really hard one fought, that wasn't until Bill Clinton came in, it was the best they could do, and there's no pay to it. 
um, we have this uh, belief that we want to keep our taxes low and we don't want all of these other benefits. You look at Denmark and they've got this incredibly high tax rate, but you've got this incredibly happy population. Why? Because you get everything that you want from paying these taxes. Um, now, we are not Denmark. The, Denmark is about, what, the size of New Jersey. They're a very different population. We are a very, we're a much more complex economy. I'm not in any sense arguing that their solutions are ours, but there's something that we should look at. When you look at child care, we had a child care um, act that passed the House in the early 70s and was uh, vetoed by Richard Nixon sort of on Cold War Soviet fears. Oh, my God, we can't have children raised in a communal setting. Um, we prefer the private setting. Well, what that's done then is we've got, we have no standards. We have no quality standards for child care. We have no... Um, uh, you know, accessibility and affordability. We've got some block grants at the state level that go to the very poorest of the poor, which is good. But certainly, when you've got you know 80 percent of child age, child uh, school age children, their mothers are work outside of the home. You've got a lot of a whole bunch of you've got single parents, you've got dual income parents, you've got you're all over the map, but you don't have the traditional system. You've got your child care costs are the Bureau of Labor Statistics estimates 17 percent of your family budget. Um, and in lower income families, it's up to, there was a, something that came out last week at 67% of the family budget. That's really unsustainable. So I think childcare is really key if we're gonna uh, move forward. And I, I would definitely encourage uh, paid parental leave for both mothers and fathers. <laughs> I don't know how likely that is we're gonna get it. You know, in the big picture, you've got to, dis, you've, you've got to disengage healthcare from your workplace and look at what we've done, uh, look at what our argument's been in the last couple months. So I don't know how likely that's gonna be anytime soon. There are things that that you can do, um, and there is a role for government to play. Uh, it's just a, an argument that we are not even having in this country. It's just not even on the agenda, and that's probably because we've got, what, 16 17% of women in Congress, and so that needs to change as well. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Phil, the last word. Well, on, on policy responses. I, I would say certainly one of the reasons the United States has a higher birth rate than any other developed country is by comparison we have a very flexible workforce that or workplace that allows for more um, part-time work you know as compared to say Germany or Japan right still a long ways to go um, but but that is important to this whole fertility question um, um, I, I think there's a lot more we can do it, it's, it's totally insane to me that we concentrate all higher education during the, these particular years of the night of one's 20s when women are in their prime reproductive age and um, you know where is it said that you have to go to college when you're 22 um, on that said I think you know we have to be careful what we wish for because I think a lot of our thinking on this is, is still got under the thrall of this almost uh, 1950s type employment pattern where uh, we all are organization men and now organization women and why can't we get this organization to be more friend family friendly whereas what the bigger picture on the labor front is more and more long-term secure salaried employment is totally vanishing you know, more and more of us are, are free agents of, of one kind contingent workers uh, the government's not even keeping track of this anymore but the last time they looked in 2005 a third of the workforce was contingent workers well they're high flex right <laughs> um, but they if you think about that population and what they need it's 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 not corporate sponsored daycare um, um, my final thought would be that ultimately you have to restore the economic basis of the family um, to bring this um, fertility question around. Um, and so we're living in a world now where childlessness really pays, right? You get your pension regardless of whether you have children, right? Your children are not economic assets to you as they were in an uh, agrarian setting or in a small shop. Some trends in technology are bringing more production back into the home. That's helpful. Um, but until we figure that out one way or another, we're going to see this long-term population aging and decline. That, that uh, brings us to this family social contract paper you and I wrote a couple years, or whatever we wrote it, sitting outside, if you want to hear more about that last point.
In any case, uh, I knew how interesting, but this has even surpassed my expectations, which were high, about how interesting this would be, having the three of you together. Will you please join me in thanking Liza and Gilbert and Phil. We're going to talk about quality child care here with the uh, federal government's director of child care, essentially, among other people, in Maryland um, uh, on the 16th of May, of May in this room at the uh, same time. But anyway, thanks for joining us today. We are adjourned.